grew up in a apostolic Kojic church. <laughs> Straight gate church. Bishop Andrew Merritt, he was apostolic. He came up under Bishop Bonner. Some of you may know Solomon's Temple. Amen. I thank God for Bishop Bonner. Thank God for uh, Bishop Merritt. But Pastor Vivica, she was Church of God in Christ. And many of my mentors were also Church of God in Christ. Mother Naomi, she taught me how to pray, essentially. She took me up under her prayer wing, and she had hands laid on her by Bishop Mason, the founder of Church of God in Christ, which those who knew Bishop Mason knew that he didn't want a denomination. That wasn't his goal. He just loved God. Amen. How many know that when you're in love with God, you don't need man's approval? Oh, y'all will get that when y'all get home. Amen. Y'all still cold. I can see y'all still coming in from the cold. Amen. How many are grateful to God that he gave us the grace to be here today? Amen. That we pushed through. Amen. How many know there's a blessing in your pressing? Amen. There is a blessing in your pressing. So growing up in this context, people would talk about fasting, and it was always kind of like, it was kind of mysterious, right? It was like, oh, wow, that's deep. That, like, you don't eat food and you pray and you see God, like, I thought that was, like, really, really deep. Like, it was like, you're a spiritual juggernaut. You're a spiritual giant if you fasted and you prayed. And it was really a big deal during the time when I grew up, uh, a quarter of a century ago at Straight Gate Church, I got saved in 1999, and I would hear people say, well, Bishop would say, we're fasting for the month of January, and I was like, oh, wow, like, well, well, I, you know, I loved God and I loved prayer, so it really wasn't a big deal for me to fast and pray. But in the back of my mind, I was always like, what does the Bible teach about it? Have you ever felt like that before? You knew your church was doing it. You knew your pastor wanted you to do it. But you were always kind of curious on what the Bible taught about it. But you didn't want to say anything because you didn't want to seem like you were being disrespectful, right? You know, you didn't want to go and say Excuse me, what does the Bible say about that? Because you felt like you didn't want to disrespect your leaders. Amen? So some of you probably feel that way now. We're going through a 21-day fasting and praying, and some of you probably feel like, okay, what's special about 21 days? There's nothing special about 21 days. The reason why we selected 21 days is because Daniel, remember last week we talked about the book of Daniel? If you weren't here last week, that's okay. You missed out, but you can go on YouTube. Amen? You can go on YouTube. How many thank God for technology? Amen? I thank God for technology. You can go on YouTube and you can look at the message. And even on Wednesday, we talked about fasting Jesus' way. So check out those two messages so you can get some more context on uh, why we chose 21 days. But simply put, Daniel, it took him 21 days to get his breakthrough. And sometimes when God is leading you to do something, you got to get in your mind to say, God, I'm not stopping until I get it. When God puts something in your heart, you got to say, Lord, I'm not stopping until I get what I came for. And that's what happened with Daniel. Daniel was studying the book of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah. And what he came across was God's promises that God was going to free his people after 70 years of captivity. So God's people, they were in captivity for 70 years. And Daniel said, hold on for a second. We need God to move, Lord. We need you to do something. So he didn't just say, God, I want you to do it. He said, God, I want you to use me to be a part of it. So Daniel began to pray, Daniel began to fast. And does anybody know how long it took Daniel for him to get his prayer heard? The first day he prayed. The Bible says the first day he prayed, he was heard. So why 21 days? What took so long? Have you ever felt like God was taking a long time to do something for you, but he already did it? You just didn't know it? And that's what happened with Daniel, right? So Daniel prayed, and, and then when Gabriel came to Daniel, uh, Daniel, he knew what Daniel was probably feeling, right? Like, what, what, what took you so long, Gabriel? Like, I've been praying and I've been fasting for these 21 days. Like, what took you so long? And the Bible says that Gabriel said the first day you prayed, God answered you. How many know that God answers us before we ask and while we're calling, he says, here I am. How many are grateful that God knows your needs? Oh, I'm excited about that. That God knows our needs, but he wants us to go to our knees. God knows our needs, but he wants us to drop to our knees. Do you know why? Because he wants a relationship with us. And because God wants a relationship with us, he'll use your need to take you to your knees. And you begin to pray, right? So, the... 
the Bible says that when Gabriel came, he explained to Daniel the reason why it took me so long to come to you because there was a fight. Somebody say, I'm in a fight. And the fight was against, it's in the unseen realm. So the devil doesn't want you to get what God has for you. So Daniel prayed 21 days because he knew that God had something for him. And I don't know who you are today. I want to encourage you. What God has for you, it's for you. So you got to press in. So we're fasting and we're praying for 21 days in order for us to get what God has for us. How many believe that God has something for you and God wants to reveal it to you? Some of you, it's a provision. Some of you, God wants to show you your gifts and your calling. Some of you, God wants to break some stuff off of you that the enemy has yoked up to you. Some of you, God is going to give all types of supernatural blessings to somebody shout out God what you have for me is for me come on open up your mouth and say God what you have for me is for me so we're fast so we got two more weeks left somebody say two more weeks now I know what the devil is telling some of y'all well I fast all the time pastor you know I'm spiritual I get it I know you spiritual I know you deep but there's something about us collectively fasting together I said there is something about us collectively fasting together. So we as a church body, we are seeking God and we're, we're doing something called the Daniel fast. Now, what is a Daniel fast? Let me just break this down real quick. So you have a total fast. Somebody say a total fast. A total fast is where you don't drink any liquids nor eat. You can only do that for about three days. But Moses did it for 80. You're not hearing me today. Moses didn't eat and he didn't drink for 40 days when he was getting what we know as the Ten Commandments, right? And then he comes down, remember how they were worshiping the golden calf? And then what happens? He broke the tablets, then he had to go up again and for another 40 days and 40 nights, he didn't eat nor drink. May I give you what my imagination tells me? It tells me that there was something so awesome about God. I believe that God's power and his majesty was so awesome. That it wasn't that Moses didn't eat. It was the fact that he was so captivated by God. That he'd rather not eat. He was in the presence of God. He was worshiping God. Don't you believe that God is so awesome that he can get your attention? That he can satisfy you in a way that no food can satisfy you? That's why Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He said, if you hunger for me, you'll never be hungry. If you thirst for me, you'll never be thirsty. How many believe that God can satisfy your appetite? If you believe that God can satisfy your soul. Come on, put your hands together and say, God, satisfy me. You're greater than anything I could want. Hallelujah. He will satisfy you. Somebody say a total fast. So a total fast is no food, no water for three days. Now we know Moses, it was really supernatural for him to do it for 80 days. I would not recommend 80 days. Amen. Three days. So I said three days. <laughs> and then you have something called a partial fast. Somebody say partial fast. A partial fast is when you drink liquids. And then you have something called a Daniel fast. And a Daniel fast says, look, you can eat food, but you, it's selected foods that you eat. Daniel just had vegetables and he had liquids. So we're asking the church to fast no meat and no sweets. That's what we're asking. Now, some of you some of you would say, Pastor, I have dietary restrictions. I can't do that. That's fine. That's between you and God. A simply put, fasting is this. Hear me. It's giving up something you like to spend time with the one you love. If you are not spending time with God, you're not fasting. You're on a diet. But yeah, amen. But if you're spending time with God, you're what? Fasting. Amen? So, what does a biblical fast look like? Let us go to Isaiah chapter number 58, verse number 1. What does a biblical fast look like? What does it look like to have a biblical fast? Isaiah 58, verse number 1. When you get there, say, Lord, I love your word. This is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah, he spoke more about Jesus than any other prophet in the Old Testament. 
The prophet Isaiah, 700 years before Christ, talked about him. This is why we know the Bible is the only word of God. There is no other book. I've studied them. The Quran, I've studied it. The Book of Mormon, I've studied it. The Jehovah Witnesses New World Translation, I know it well. No other book foretells what God is going to do and do it. Like the Biblios, the 66 books you have before you. Amen? Here we go. Isaiah 58, verse number 1. Cry aloud and do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Are you there? Declare it to my people. This is God speaking through the prophet. Declare it to my people their transgression. To the house of Jacob their sins. Verse number 2. Let Yet they seek me daily. They're coming to church all the time and delight to know my ways. They're actually pretending like they want to know me. As if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They're acting like they want to know my way, but they're doing their own thing. They ask of me righteous judgment. They delight to draw near to God. Verse number three. Why have we fasted and you see it not? God, don't you see what I'm doing for you? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge? God, you're acting like... I'm not doing this, Lord. Don't you see what I'm doing? Verse number, look, continue. Behold, are you with me? In the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure. God is like, you're not seeking me. You just want what you want. And you oppress all your workers. You're not treating people the right way. Verse number four, are you with me? Isaiah 58, four, are you with me? Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with the fist of, and to hit with the wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such a fast that I chose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it a day to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast? An acceptable day to the Lord? Verse 6. Is not this the fast that I've chosen? Let me tell you what I want to do. I know what y'all talking about, but let me tell you what I want to do when you fast. Watch this. He says, I want to loose the bands of wickedness, hallelujah, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free. I want to break every yoke, hallelujah. Verse number seven, but look what you got to do. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? The same food that you're not eating, shouldn't you be sharing it with people? And to bring the homeless poor into your house, shouldn't you be helping out people who are poor? When you see the naked cover them, shouldn't you be covering people and helping them out? And not hide your face from your own flesh? Shouldn't you be reaching out to your family members you don't like? This is what God is saying you should be doing when you fast. Come on, hang out with me now. Don't hang up the phone. Verse number 8. He said, now look at what's going to happen. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn. Everybody's going to see clear that you're, that you're giving me glory. And look, look at this. Supernatural healing is going to happen. And your healing shall spring up speedily. Uh-huh. And your righteousness shall go before you. And the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. God is saying, I'm going to protect you. Verse number 9. Then you shall call and I will answer you. I'm going to begin to answer your prayers. And you shall cry and I'm going to show up. I'm going to tell you, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, somebody say, stop gossiping. In speaking wickedness, somebody say, stop murmuring and complaining. He said, you got to do your part too now. Verse number 10, if you pour out yourself for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, if you help people that can't help themselves, look what will happen. Then shall your light arise in the darkness. And your gloom shall be as the noonday, and the Lord will guide you continually. Anybody need to be guided by God? He's saying, when you fast the way I want you to fast, I'm going to guide you continually. And satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a water garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And look, at, look what else I'm going to do for you. Look at verse number 12. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You know how Detroit is toe up from the flow up and Pontiac is toe up and Flint and Saginaw? Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to rebuild those cities for you. And you shall rise up the foundations. He said he was a firm foundation, right? We just sang that. For many generations. This is awesome. 
and you shall be called the repair of the breach. People are going to look at you and say, it was my dad that fast for me, my mom that fast for me. They were willing to fast for me. They repair things that were broken down before. Hallelujah. And you're going to restore the restore of the streets to dwell. In verse number 13, if you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your own pleasure on my holy day, if you stop doing your will and you do my will, look at what he says. And you call my Sabbath a delight. If you start gathering together on my day, the holy day of the Lord, and you keep it honorable, if you honor it, not going your own way, or seeking your own pleasure, or just talking idly, look at what he said he'll do in verse 14. Then you shall take delight in the Lord. You're going to be happy just to know me. And I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, my God. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. Yeah, you're fasting, but I'm going to feed you. For the mouth of the Lord has what? Spoken it. What does biblical fasting look at? Look like, point number one. Bl biblical fasting looks like you hearing and doing the word of God. What does biblical fa fasting look like? It looks like you sacrificing for the poor and sacrificing for your family. Here's the thing I want you to take home. I want you to think about this all week and why we fast and pray. Fasting is temporary, but the change is what? Oh, what God is about to do in you, it's going to be permanent. What God's about to do through you is going to be permanent. You just got to hear him saying to you, just like he said through the prophet, I want to deal with your transgressions and your sins. How many would agree there's things in our life that God needs to free us from today? How many would agree there's things in our life that's not pleasing God and he wants to set us free? Just like the children of Israel, this is what they were doing. They had a form of godliness, but they were denying the power thereof. They were coming to church, but they were never ahead of the church. They were coming to church, but they were never a part of the head of the church. They were coming to church, but they were really not a part of the body of Christ. They were seeking God, but they didn't understand the power of God. They were saying, Lord, I worship you, but didn't understand the one they were worshiping has all power and all authority. What they were doing is they were praising God with their mouth, but their heart was far from them. They were coming to church, but they weren't letting God change their heart. And in this season of fasting and praying, God's about to do something in your heart. God's about to renew your mind. Uh, God's about to do something you can't do in your own power. You can't do in your own effort. All you got to do is set aside your plate. All you you got to do is go to God and say, Lord, I want to be a hearer of your word. I want to be a doer of your word. Lord, it's not about my way. God set me free from the things that I can't set myself from. The Bible says we're sin abound, grace much more abound. There may be things in your life right now that just say, God, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm sick and tired of trying to do this thing in my own power. I'm sick and tired of trying to do this thing in my own ability. Lord, I'm coming to you. I'm not pretending anymore that I could do this thing in my own power. I'm not pretending anymore that I could do this thing in my own effort. What fasting is about, it's about you going to God and saying, Lord, I am setting aside time with you. Lord, I am pushing away my plate. Lord, I'm sacrificing, and I want to hear your word. I want to do your word. But I can't do it in my own effort, in my own ability. Lord, would you write your word in my heart? For the Bible says that God, he would give us a new covenant. The Bible says that he would write his word on our heart and on our mind. Uh, the Bible says that he would take our stony hearts and he would give us a heart of flesh. How many know that when you fast and you pray, God makes your heart soft? And some of you would say, Pastor, I need change in my life. This is the season where when God did it for Moses, he's going to do it for you. This is the season where you would say, God, if you did it for David, God, do it for me. This is the season where you will say, God created me a clean heart. Lord, renew a right spirit in me. This is the season where you say, God, may the word 
words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, you be my strength and you be my redeemer. This is the season where you go to God with fasting and praying and saying, Lord, not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh, Lord, in need of prayer. If that you put your hands together and say, God, I want to be a hearer and a doer of your word. Biblical fasting looks like you going to God and saying, God, I need you, Jesus. Lord, I'm pushing away this meal, God, because I want to seek your face, Jesus. But not only are you being a hearer and a doer of your word, do you want to know what biblical fasting looks like? It looks like you sacrificing for the poor. It's not only about you sacrificing for the poor. It's about you sacrificing for them no good family members. He said it. Verse number eight. He said your own flesh. Look at what it says. You know that family member you're hiding from? It's the verse. See, y'all don't look. Look at the verse. Go to verse number eight. See, y'all think I'll just go to verse number eight. It's right here. Verse number eight. Look at verse number eight. No, ver verse number seven. I'm sorry. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? So the same food that you would be eating, you need to go share with somebody. And bring what? The homeless. Who can you help that's homeless right now? Some, some of the people you see walking up and down the street, who can you help? This is the fast that God is saying, the one I want. This is what biblical fasting is. It's a season of sacrifice. Somebody say sacrifice. Now look at this. Here's the part, y'all. Don't hang up on me. Look at this. When you see the naked, that you do what? Who is it right now that you can expose that you're supposed to cover? Who is the person right now that you can say, look at what they doing. Look at them. They wrong. The Bible says that Noah had three sons. One of his sons said, daddy's naked, and the other two, he covered them. Who are you supposed to be covering right now that you could easily expose? Help me, Holy Ghost. You're talking to me now as I'm preaching. Come on now. Who is that person that you know they owe you something? And you could tell a world, and you would be right. According to man, but wrong according to God. Because how many know that even with God's judgment, there comes mercy? Don't hang up on me. Look at the next part. Here it is. And not to hide yourself from that sister that get on your last nerve. Ooh. That uncle, that brother, your own flesh. You know that person that called you. I got some family members. I blocked y'all. And God is saying, not in this season, son. This is the season where I want you to go to him. And I want you to sacrifice for him. This is a season of fasting and praying when I want you to pray for him. Watch this. I love the Holy Ghost. I love what he's doing right now. Now, some of you would say, Pastor, why would I talk to a family member that I know when I talk to them, they get on my last nerve? Pastor, why would I call that niece? Pastor, why would I call that nephew? Pastor, why would I call that cousin? Pastor, why every time I call them, they're asking me for money. This is why you got to call them. Because if you reach out to them, God's going to show you how powerful your prayer really has been for them. <laughs> it's about to be an awesome testimony, y'all. You got to pray for that family member. You got to pray for that person. And you got to pray for that brother and that sister. And you got to begin to pray for them right now in the name of Jesus. You got to begin to intercede for them. And when you call them, what they say is going to be a testimony that God heard your prayer. You ain't hearing me today, church. Don't hide yourself from your own flesh. Don't hide yourself from that family member and that friend, that person that's gotten on your last nerve. I know who God is talking to me about. There are three people that I know that the Holy Ghost has said, son, you need to call them in this season. Uh, you need to reach out to them, and you need to pray for them. You need to find a way to sacrifice for them. You need to find a way to be there for them. He said, if you do that, look at what's going to happen in verse number eight. He said, then your light is going to shine. He said, then people are going to see it should me and not you. Then people are going to see that I am the light of the world through you. Then people are going to
going to see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. He said, look what's going to happen. I'm going to begin to heal you. I'm going to heal you from the pain. I'm going to heal you from the hurt. I'm going to heal you from the anxiety. If you do your part, I will do my part. Do I got somebody in here that says, God, let my light bring forth. Lord, begin to heal my body. He said, then righteousness will go before you. Watch this. Then God said, my glory will be your protection. Don't you know that God will begin to protect you? If you do your part, he will do his part. I know it's a step of faith. I don't want to call my sister, y'all. I don't want to call her. I don't want to reach out to her. Because she just got locked up. And my nieces and my nephews almost went into the system. What's your testimony? What's the thing that you would say? Pastor, I don't want to reach out to my brother. Because he beat my niece. And now his rights have been revoked. I don't want to, y'all. I don't, I got every excuse in the world. But remember, biblical fasting is not about you. The children of Israel, they made it about them, their own pleasure. Fasting is about sacrificing. Fasting is about saying to God, not only am I sacrificing my food, I'm sacrificing my own understanding. And Lord, I'm believing that you are going to cause your light to break forth. Healing to happen. Your righteousness to go before me. And you are going to be my protection. Do you have that family member in mind that you need to talk to? Do you have that person in mind that you would say, Pastor, that's the one I don't want to talk to them? Who's the one? Is it a brother? Is it a friend? Pastor, every time I talk to that family member, they ask me for money. Do you know that this is the season where if you would sacrifice for them, God is going to get glory. He is going to get honor. And he's going to get the praise. This is the one thing I want you to take home. Fasting is temporary, but guess what? The change is going to be permanent. Fasting is temporary, but what God is about to do in you and through you for his glory, it is going to be permanent. This time of fasting and praying, oh, it's temporary. But how God is going to show his glory through you, it will be permanent. Are you willing to say, Lord, here I am? Lord, just use me. Come on, everybody, just lift your hands to God. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for this, your great people. In this time of fasting and praying, Lord, help us push aside our plate. Help us spend time seeking you and help us sacrifice for our family members, Lord. Help us do what Dr. King said. Help us project the I into the thou. Help us do what Dr. King said, Lord. Help us be willing to administer first aid to our family members who are hurting. Help us, oh God, be hearers of your word and doers of your work. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, put your hands together and give your great God great glory. Will you get an offering in your hand today? I have a dream. Amen. If you need an offering envelope, come on, wave at us. It's deeply rooted in the American dream. Come on, if you need an offering envelope, just wave at us. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. All we're saying to America is to be true to what you said on paper. If I lived in China or Russia or any totalitarian country, maybe I can understand some of these illegal injunctions. Maybe I can understand the denial of certain First Amendment rights because they haven't given themselves to that over there. But somewhere I've read of the freedom to assemble. Somewhere I've read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I've read of the freedom to protest. Somewhere I've read that the greatness of America is the right to protest for right. So just like we're not going to allow any dogs, any water hoses to turn us around, we won't allow any injunction to turn us around. We're moving on. 
Come on, ushers, won't you come on down? It really don't matter to me now. We've got some difficult days ahead. I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But it really don't matter to me now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go to the mountaintop. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But we as a people, we will get to the promised land. So I'm not fearing any man. I'm not fearing anybody. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Will you get that offering in your hand? Thank you so much for your giving. Thank you so much for your giving. Amen. You're up under the direction of the ushers. We are masters. In disarming police forces with nonviolence. I've seen it so many times. I remember being in Birmingham, Alabama. Bull Connor, he would say, Sick the dogs on us. And we would see the dogs coming and we would just sing, Ain't gonna allow nobody to turn us around. And I remember they would turn on the water hoses. But Bull Connor, he didn't know the trans physics that we knew of. Whether we were Baptists or another denomination, we had been immersed, but we had known water. But we were Catholic or Methodist, we had been sprinkled, but we had known water. So we transformed that bull into a steer, and we won our battle in Birmingham. We need to do the same thing in Memphis. Thank you so much for your giving today. Let us remember that we stand on the soldiers of those that sacrificed for us. And if I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been there in 1960 when college students sat in at counters and when they were sitting down, they were really standing up for the deep wells that were dug by the founding fathers in the Declaration of Independence and in the Constitution. And they had woke up the conscience of our nation if I had sneezed. I wouldn't have been around in 1961 as we traveled to end segregation in interstate travel if I had sneezed. I wouldn't have been around in 1963 to tell America about a dream that I had had. Thank you so much for your giving. Thank you so much for your giving today. We can't live without you. Can't live without you. Oh, we need you. If you need him, would you please stand? Come on, if you need him, would you please stand? Come on, worship team. Let's worship at 180 Church. Oh, we need you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up the light of his countenance upon you. And may he give you his peace. Father, would you make us dreamers again? Make us a people that go to the mountaintop in prayer. Help us see what you've promised. Help us understand for such a time as this, you've called 180 Church to do exploits in the earth. Help us fast these next two weeks. Lord, I pray for those that have already made up their mind what they're not doing. Show them that your presence is greater than anything. Hallelujah. Oh my God, I pray, Father, please show this your great people 
the power of your presence. Father, I'm asking that you would help us step into biblical fasting, that we won't murmur, we won't argue, we won't complain, we will sacrifice for family members, we will sacrifice for the poor, we would hear your word, and we would do your word. Now unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us before himself with exceeding great joy. To the only wise God be glory, honor, dominion, and power now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, let's put our hands together and give our great God great glory. Come on, greet somebody with a handshake or a hug and say, I'll be praying for you this week. I love